think we're going to get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the American Society of Criminology's Volmer Award Address. My name is Cynthia Lum, and I'm joined by Professor Chris Coper here at George Mason University's Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy, housed in its Department of Criminology, Law, and Society. Chris and I are the Editors-in-Chief of Criminology and Public Policy, the flagship policy journal of the American Society of Criminology, which is currently housed here at George Mason. This high impact journal publishes empirical research that examines justice policies and practices to inform criminal justice decision making. The Volmer Address is published in the journal in the subsequent year of the award. We want to welcome and thank the over 750 registrants to this webinar from all around the globe, representing hundreds of organizations. We encourage all of you to look at the journal and to consider joining the American Society of Criminology. We will send information on how to do that in a follow-up email after today's presentation. The August Vollmer Award was established in 1959 by the American Society of Criminology and is given each year at the November ASC Annual Conference. The award's namesake is August Vollmer, who founded the American Society of Criminology. Volmer was the first police chief of Berkeley, California, and was recognized for his reforms in policing and his interests in linking science and education with policing and criminal justice more generally. The Volmer Award recognizes an individual whose scholarship and professional activities have made outstanding contributions to justice and to the treatment or prevention of crime. We are pleased to welcome the 2020 Volmer Award winner, Professor Lawrence Sherman, to inaugurate the first webinar format of this address. Professor Sherman holds a joint appointment as Distinguished University Professor at the University of Maryland and Professor Emeritus at the University of Cambridge. Professor Sherman exemplifies and embodies the spirit of this award. He is recognized as the father of evidence-based policing, and his lifelong efforts in developing extensive research and evaluation across multiple domains of law enforcement operations, organization, and reform are widely heralded as some of the most significant and impactful efforts in criminology. He's also worked to translate and institutionalize research into practice, especially his educational efforts to train police leaders in this professional research knowledge at Cambridge. Chris and I ourselves are long ago students of Larry's and our own efforts reflect his training and support. So it gives us especially great pleasure to introduce Professor Lawrence Sherman, who will now present the 2020 Volmer Award Address entitled Goldilocks and the Three T's, Targeting, Testing and Tracking, Sweet Spots of Democratic Policing. Professor Sherman. Hello. The title of this lecture you've just heard is one that you can read in slightly different format in Criminology and Public Policy, as Cynthia told you. I'm very grateful for your joining us today for the live video version, which uh, given the um, huge flood of events affecting police legitimacy since I finished the written version of it, I've added new content today that's not in the written version and hope to have a subsequent uh, version that updates as much as we can. But as we know, policing is at a critical point in its history. And the idea of using evidence to help shape the future of policing is what lies behind my effort to promote the use of three kinds of evidence in democratic dialogues uh, over the legitimacy of policing and how to get policing just right because liberal democracy is a treasure and the police are its guardians. But as the Roman poet Juvenal asked many centuries ago, who shall guard the guardians themselves? Who shall guard the police against both under-policing and over-policing? And my answer is all of us, because as Robert Peel's memorial has put it, the police are the people and the people are the police. At least that is the ideal for a, a liberal democracy. And certainly the allegations of under-policing that have afflicted liberal democracy 
um, didn't start with January 6th of 2021, uh, but we certainly saw the challenge that the police faced when they had inadequate numbers to deal with the task that they had at hand. So the charge was partly to blame the police, partly to blame the Congress and others um, in, in a way that of course was far more severe in its uh, initial um, assessment of over-policing with a murder committed by a Minneapolis police officer over an alleged $20 crime. So these two constant challenges to police legitimacy need to be defined before we proceed with my suggestion that under-policing consists of failing to protect the safety of those in greatest need of protection from harm, for people in high crime neighborhoods, for example, and indeed police officers uh, who are working under dangerous conditions themselves. At the same time, liberal democracy and the police need to be protected from over-policing um, and to um, fail to protect the liberty as opposed to the safety of those who may often be deemed at most risk of causing harm, but who are also at most risk of losing their liberty in a way that is not justified and not consistent with the values of liberal democracy. As my colleagues, Anthony Bottoms and Justice Tankaby have suggested, these are complex issues and we need to talk. We need to talk about the facts of policing because often there is no single right answer no one way to get policing just right, at least not based on objective facts. Even with evidence-based policing, we face the truth that perceptions of policing as being legitimate are fundamentally subjective. They may be widely shared by many people, but the perceptions, the emotional dimension of processing information, the process of reaching consensus, is inescapably an experience as distinct from a systematic observation that you can use with a microscope. So if we ask using evidence or scientific measurement, can we define just right policing? Probably not. We can think of it as a socially constructed subjective consensus uh, that consists of a midpoint with a range of disagreement on either sides of the question but it can best be established in ways that promote democratic values with the transparency of all relevant facts so that we can peacefully manage conflict by dialogue in the ways that Bottoms and Tankaby suggest. This dialogue can be seen as a process of drawing the lines between too much policing and too little policing so that we get just right policing. And if we think about it, understandably, most policing in most liberal democracies, most of the time, is just right. That's why we don't hear about it. The ordinary uh, nature, the unremarkable outcomes of 65, 70 million police encounters a year in the United States, for example, don't attract attacks on legitimacy because most of the time it's just right, but we are rarely told about that. It's not what the news finds interesting to report. But in a global media world, what we mostly hear about is the most extreme events occurring anywhere in the world, such as the murder of an Aboriginal uh, suspect uh, that has been under uh, scrutiny in Australia and which I read about uh, the other day in a context of media that 30 years ago, I was unlikely to have found out about uh, before I had a digital access to newspapers all over the world. Uh, so similarly, police legitimacy in London suffered from US stories on policing, uh, over-policing of black Americans in a way that a recent article in the British Journal of Political Science um, by Professor Lanayou, uh has documented, uh, which is the effect of police killings of black Americans on black British attitudes towards British police. So we are in this world in which we hear even more often about the more extreme long tails of events that drive people to say the police aren't right because they're either under or over policing. And more often, I would suggest that if it involves the police in any issue of law enforcement, the tendency is to blame the police rather than the government 
that puts the police in that difficult uh, position. Um, and indeed, government's failure to guard itself adequately with sufficient policing has been vividly uh, documented by the recent investigations into the threats and attempts to murder the Vice President of the United States as he was sharing a process of counting electoral uh, votes. Even in Canada, the allegations of governments failing to provide sufficient resources for policing have been reported uh, over the past week with such facts as 7,000 demonstrators in Ottawa on, on the 6th of February with 500 police, the mayor asking for 1,800 more, the prime minister saying, well, you're not gonna get the army, which uh, has also been suggested, and the local police board chair saying, this group is a threat to our democracy. This is a nationwide insurrection. This is madness. And it's been described as under policing with the Ottawa police taking the blame for not having uh, done more to stop the trucks from disrupting life in Ottawa. With uh, a, a more micro level uh, impact on everyday lives of everyday people rather than the future of governments and governance, we see under policing a challenge in cases like the recent murder of a woman whose ex-husband had threatened repeatedly to kill her and who was uh, wanted for arrest over his breach of a stalking order and who stabbed her to death in front of quite a few people um, in broad daylight on the streets near her home. Uh, the argument here is that the police should have prioritized the protection of this woman in Maida Vale in London. And the question then becomes, how do we sort priorities among all of the uh, tens of thousands of demands on the police every day, every hour? How can they get it right as to who to protect because they're in the greatest need of being protected in cases like this? At the same time that in um, this same country, uh, the Welsh police with much less demand than in London uh, reacted to six complaints uh, about a poster that this woman, Jennifer Swain, had put up in several locations in that town. And they raided her house, took a book that they thought might be implicated in some violation of law and um, took her to a police station, which she couldn't um, uh, go to in a police car without lying flat on the floor of a police van because she was handicapped and had actually used her mobility scooter to post these signs. Over-policing was the unanimous reaction of the London elite. It may have looked different from uh, the town where it occurred and certainly from the perspective of the officers. But guarding free speech, seizing books, these are very, very challenging issues for the protection of liberal democracy, as is the pattern of no-knock dawn raids in which white police officers kill black people, sadly, as Minneapolis has just recently done, despite a history of dialogue about no-knock orders in which there was something of a consensus that the police shouldn't use them, but in which there was a demand uh, by the Minneapolis police officers to use that uh, as reported uh, on a St. Paul homicide investigation. Sadly, we see under-policing of officer safety with um, not only these two officers whose families had recently um, come from the Dominican Republic as immigrants seeking the benefits of liberal democracy, um, but also the general increase in homicide in which they are caught up in an even larger increase in the rate at which police are being killed with a 59% increase in the most recent calendar year compared to uh, 2020. Um, and that sad, um, failure to protect police at risk in dealing with these situations shows that this is not simply a one side versus another, but rather a question for everybody uh, that I have been working on for about five decades. So that research question is, can more widespread use of better research evidence on targeting, testing, and tracking police actions shared more clearly and in dialogue among the public and police themselves help to reduce the wide range of oscillation between over-policing and under-policing. Swinging back and forth, one day we hear the police do too much, the next day we hear they don't do enough. How can evidence about those issues help? 
Well, evidence has various characteristics. Let's start with the fundamentals, the three research methods that can be, and in fact are being used much more intensively in all things that the police do. The first being the measurement of risk forecasts with precision and known error rates to guide the way police set their priorities and the way in which they take precautionary actions, uh, sometimes with uh, harmful consequences, that risk forecasting, that measurement needs to be better than guesses or prejudices, or, you know, it ain't rocket science. Anybody can see that's dangerous. So, you know, we have to take preemptive action. Measurement of risk forecast also says, uh, also allows the police to say, this fellow really is very likely to kill his ex-wife, as opposed to this fellow who might be angrier uh, and more volatile, volatile, but the data on that person uh, is part of a pattern from tens of thousands of people that suggests he's not really at high risk. A second kind of methodology is testing for causation to find out what police methods reduce risks as opposed to increasing them, uh, showing that in fact, victims are protected by arrest for domestic abuse as opposed to having uh, for black women in Milwaukee, as our research showed recently, having their risk of all cause mortality doubled uh, if there is an arrest made in the name of protecting them. That's what you get from experiments, as opposed to anecdotes, as opposed to common sense. And that's what contributes to the third method of what's sometimes called cost effectiveness, but in a moral sense, the costs are the harm that people suffer and the proportionality uh, in the harm that police may inflict in order to prevent other harms that might be greater. And to understand that ratio in a precise way would be in a very important sense, part of the dialogue between police and community. And that dialogue can be structured around the three T's of evidence-based policing that I suggested in Crime and Justice in 2013 with the rise of evidence-based policing focused on targeting of police resources where they are most needed and can do the most good, testing what methods would work for policing, what tactics or strategies police can find to be effective or in fact ineffective or backfiring and making things worse. And then finally, <clears throat> tracking what the police are doing, where they're doing it, who they're doing it to, and to have more appropriate denominators. Uh, to compute rates of different actions and crimes uh, for different groups in society, including different races, religions, ethnicities, et cetera. Now, getting all of that complexity together into a public understanding of what police do gives us a chance to figure out what theory of learning might work best. And the premise of the three T's is that mnemonic techniques or ways of remembering things simply there are powerful ways to learn large amounts of information. And a recent review in uh, psychological science of the American Psychological Association concluded that they work, but they're not used, which sounds a lot like many uh, practices in policing, which have been tested um, and which do work, which are being used. Mnemonics, uh, like the three T's, uh, become a memory device as a learning technique that aids information retention or retrieval. And what I find with my students is that they can uh, retain the idea of the three T's um, better than they can always uh, spell out exactly what the three T's are and what they mean. But once you can retain them, then you can start to retrieve them in human memory for better understanding. And I think liberal democracy needs more mnemonics beyond phrases that might be quite hard to define, like free speech and liberty. If we start to think about mnemonics that help us to become precise, we know that they will be easy for both the police and the public to remember, uh, to apply to many complex issues, and make it easier to discuss them in a constructive dialogue around the facts as Bottoms and Tankaby have suggested. Now, the three police practices that I think are most often found at the extreme tales of the distribution and that challenge police legitimacy the most are killing people, stopping people, and not patrolling hotspots of violence. 
The third one is an example of under policing and which can account for uh, possibly a part of the rapid increase in murder that has occurred uh, in the last two years in the US um, and indeed in the last five years in the UK, whether there have been um, uh, failures to provide patrol that could have been targeted to where murder could be prevented. This is part of the under policing dilemma of everyday life. On the other hand, the over policing through killing people when it wasn't necessary to do so, again, a subjective judgment as opposed to absolutely objective uh, from observation, um, and indeed stopping people with the presumption that stops help to deter people from carrying weapons, and that will lower the murder rate, uh, which has some uh, quasi-experimental support, but yet not randomized controlled trial support. And therefore, identifying the anger that Americans and British people have over stop and search, uh, as well as killing people, uh, and the anger people have over crime rate waves uh, coming up with violent crime suggests that these three practices are at least a good example for a goal of using dialogue to reach a consensus on what is too little policing of these serious problems, what is too much, and what is indeed the right amount. Which brings us to the Goldilocks principle, which is based on an English language folktale. I found out in Sweden last week that they'd never heard of it. Project Gutenberg has the 1918 book uh, with an advanced version of the story uh, about Goldilocks, who is um, a uh, young girl who goes into the house of three bears to find three bowls of porridge. She tries the first one and says, ow, oh, it's too hot. Then she tries the second one and said, oh no, it's too cold. And the third one she tested said, uh, led her to say, yum, that's just right. So the idea of getting policing just right is uh, something that you see in many sciences, from psychology to economics and engineering. Um, this widely known scientific principle is uh, strongly distinguished from the dose response curve in which there seems to be an unending linear relationship between the more of this, the more of that. It's much more like the principle of a sweet spot and indeed the original title for this talk uh, about just right policing, not too much, not too little, but just enough and the right kind of policing for a situation. And my uh, late colleague, Stephen Hawking here at Cambridge, an astrophysicist, uh, became quite interested in the fact that the development of intelligent life requires that planetary temperatures be just right. And a number of uh, astrophysicists have studied uh, the likely temperatures of different universes to understand the paradox about how life emerged here and how closely it was related to the Goldilocks principle. So what can we do to help policing become just right in terms of the three T decisions. First, to target selectively by identifying the highest risks of predicted and preventable harms, as Steve Jobs put it, to decide what not to do, as well as what to do, or at least what to prioritize. Secondly, testing for the amount of harm, how much harm do we get by taking police actions that would try to prevent that harm but trying also to minimize the harm that is caused by policing in the process with everything from stop and search uh, to even doing routine patrols, but in the right places at the right time. And finally, tracking to see whether A, police are doing what has been tested and targeted, but B, whether the amount of harm that is caused by what they do remains lower and hopefully far lower than the amount of harm that those police actions prevent. In the COPER curve, uh, coming out of the master's thesis by the current co-editor-in-chief of Criminology and Public Policy Journal, uh, what we see is an example of if you do more of something, you get more benefit, that is the more minutes the police patrolled in Minneapolis hotspots, the longer the time frame after the police left in which there weren't any more crimes, um, what I had called residual deterrence, that is deterring crime after the police leave. 
And at what point does it become too much? And in fact, Chris found that between 10 and 15 minutes was the just right period in the length of time police spent at a hotspot, after which the benefit actually saw diminishing returns. And this gives uh, the police who uh, are being told to do this now all over Britain in the 18 most violent uh, stricken police forces, uh, a reason for why they need to stay there uh, 15 minutes. Um, we're just at the beginning of uh, doing experimental research on lengths of patrol in different kinds of contexts, how long the residual deterrence lasts after the police leave. But it's not as if the Goldilocks principle has no uh, prior uh, presence in policing. In fact, the Cobra curve is probably one of the most widely understood mnemonics uh, in English language policing uh, around the world. And I venture to say that you could go into most police stations in New Zealand and you'd find somebody who could explain the Cobra curve to you as well as in Australia, uh, Canada, uh, the United States and, uh, and the UK for sure. But the proportionality idea of having the right ratio between how much policing uh, you want to deliver and how much harm is appropriate to deserve that much policing may be too complex and too subjective an idea to apply in everyday practice or indeed dialogue between police and public about policies and procedures. The idea of trying to do minimal harm in all places at all times, trying to do the least policing possible to get the best benefit that you can is possibly much simpler. And it's what Sir Dennis, uh, who was former chief regulator of all the police in England and Wales and teaches here at Cambridge, he may be quite right to say that for everyday memory of what principle to practice in split second decision making, minimal harm is clearer than proportionality. But in community dialogues with all the facts on the table, it may be that we need some goal for setting a balance between policing and uh, the harms of policing, the benefits of policing to get to just right policing. So to summarize so far, this paper suggests that the three T's offer a decision framework for both the police and the public to discuss what they agree the police should do or prioritize and what they should not do, or at least put very low in their priorities. And to do that and make those decisions based on what is most proportionate with minimal harm by the police, uh, driven to address high harm risks first, and only as a matter of secondary investment of their time to go to respond to high volume but low harm needs for or demands for police, and to explore uh, less expensive and indeed less harmful ways to do that, such as video uh, conversations on Skype or um, uh, whatever uh, technology is available to have somebody see a police officer who doesn't have to drive to where they are located, they can have an immediate conversation. And there are experiments doing that so far, and as cited in this journal article that is in criminology and public policy. The full scope of with, which begins with the introduction that I've just given, uh, goes on to a history of the oscillations uh, from over to under policing, um, uh, much of it's focused on New York, where I started my police research career, and where I trace the, the decades from chaos of uh, police losing control of the streets to a massive crime drop, to a reversal to defund the police, and, and then to snap back from that very quickly in the face of very rapid increases in homicides and um, and, and shootings all over New York City. I'm not going to talk about that here today. I, I let the written version stand by that, uh, as well as the just measures of pain and the, the argument for why killing, stopping, and patrolling should be given such prominence in this discussion. But at least they are examples of what could be done with virtually anything the police uh, do. Uh, to which you could apply the three T's. So if we take those three measures as just an example, uh, what we see in the end is the potential for pracademics, police officers who do research, who understand research, who can 
discuss what the research shows about local policing with people who live in local areas and even an experimental design for testing the theory of Bottoms and Tankaby about promoting these kinds of dialogue. So first, how do we illustrate using the three T's with police killing people? Well, one very important need is to target situations where uh, killing might be the only way to reduce risk, but to think more broadly about ways that those situations could be prevented uh, way upstream in time from uh, the life or death decision that is often used as an excuse when it really isn't if we could structure police as an engineering process for order management in ways that protected police officers uh, much more systematically than simply calling on them to decide whether or not to shoot somebody once their own life is very much at risk and where sometimes shooting is not going to happen fast enough to save their lives as we have seen so tragically. The idea that something has to be done right away is something that needs to be examined because targeting so many of the students, uh, as I wrote in 2018, uh, for uh, reduction of pressure of time to get the situation resolved might in fact many, save many lives, lives of the victims of the shootings by police, lives of police as victims of, of being killed in the course of their work. And once you can target different kinds of situations, mental uh, illness, for example, you might even think of other ways to respond as Albuquerque and some other cities are experimenting with sending not police as first responders, but mental health workers. And here again, careful research is needed because mental health workers may wind up getting killed in situations in which uh, the presumption that they will manage violence better than police um, may not be warranted by the facts when tested in the field. So the testing of these alternatives with different tactics, different providers, uh, would all be ways of reducing police killing people. But a very important uh, opportunity, as um, our recent annals volume on fatal shootings by police showed, is first aid treatment delivered by police in the immediate aftermath of a post-shooting rather than standing around while people were bleeding out as in the Oklahoma City case, uh, filmed on video with people counting the seconds of nobody doing anything to stop this man from bleeding to death. Now, I'm not saying every case can be dealt with in that way, but I am saying that in places like Philadelphia where they have very aggressively told police to put people who have been shot for any reason in a police car and be taken to the nearest um, first aid, uh, sorry, the nearest emergency room, uh, gives us examples for how lives might be saved right across the country, as Frank Zimmering suggested in his book, uh, When Police Kill. The tracking officers who use their guns at a much higher rate than other officers, as demonstrated by the Chicago research by um, Andrew Papachristos at Northwestern and his colleagues. Um, the example of the Pennsylvania State Trooper recently reported in the New York Times who had killed four people in four separate in incidents gives us an example of what can be tracked. Dialogue here is about talking about facts of patterns and not the particulars of cases. It will be unavoidable that police will have to talk about particulars of cases, especially when people are killed. But when we're talking about stop and search in high volumes, tens of thousands across cities, uh, or more recently, hundreds of thousands in, in London and New York uh, with sharp cutbacks uh, and then resurgence, um, these are things that can be discussed with patterns, just as where patrols are being concentrated and why they're in some areas rather than others. Uh, this gets to Tankaby's uh, concern and his evidence that a police must be seen to be both effective in protecting people as well as being fair in the ways that they do it. But most importantly is the comments of the vaccine minister of the United Kingdom, who said, basically, you've got to discuss the data to have a dialogue. And so he's saying this about COVID, I'm saying it about cops. Nadim Zawahi said, I'm obsessed by making sure we collect data and publish it. Data and transparency are my allies on this journey. The way you get complex systems to improve and deliver is by being transparent and publishing. And the US data on killings by police is nowhere to be seen in this discussion. 
there is no official mandatory reporting of police killing people in the line of duty because the US Congress refuses to require it, although there is a, a proposal uh, uh, in Congress right now to do a lot of things, including creating a national list of people who've been fired from police forces so they shouldn't be rehired by others, something that was only established eight years ago here in the UK, but which now has 2,500 officers on the list. The, the failure to have these data be transparent, I think, is part of losing police legitimacy. And the fact that the Washington Post has become the authoritative source of when, where, and how police are killing people really implies a cover-up. It took the Washington Post to discover what Richard Nixon was doing in the Watergate, and that association doesn't go away. Official statistics are things liberal democracies provide because they want their citizens to know what's being done and to be able to vote in an informed way. Just like when we have police stop people in micro areas of high violence, we can explain why that is being done there and also why it is not being done elsewhere if that is the decision that could be reached. And to have even more stop and search than we do at present in high murder hotspots might in fact reduce the murder rate even if stop and search came virtually to a halt anywhere that wasn't in a high risk zone of the kind that was declared in Britain during the COVID pandemic and for more severe lockdown in relation to the death rate. Now, testing what works in those areas is an important part of the justification, and we still need more randomized trials of uh, stopping of people in high violence areas. And the more of that research we have, the greater we can create legitimacy around the idea of trying to close the huge gap of five to one or more in the homicide victimization rate between Black Britons and White Britons or Black Americans and White Americans. And that inequality of murder risk is something that could drive inequality of police response in a way that is responsive to the murder risk itself as the basis for uh, testing the uh, intrusive uh, and uh, deprivation of liberty that nobody wants to see happen unless it has the greatest justification of saving lives. And to track the way in which police do that, as a procedural justice matter through body-worn video cameras that can be reviewed with supervisors who might give tips and pointers on how to be somewhat nicer. As uh, I have heard at community meetings in London where parents of murdered victims have said, we want police to do more stop and search, but we want them to be nice about it. Uh, you couldn't summarize it more uh, succinctly and the way of getting there, I think, is with more evidence that actually looks at the conversations and the body language that is being used in these stop and searches so that the feedback itself can help to shape the practice more in the direction that is acceptable to everybody who experiences these kinds of interactions with the police. So for all these reasons, uh, a good example is Gladwell's praise for the Kansas City gun experiment. You stop and search where murder is concentrated. Don't use it where Sandra Bland was stopped for changing lanes without signaling, put in jail for two nights and committed suicide. Um, he says on page 216 of talking to strangers that the location of the stop of Sandra Bland was three miles away from the nearest locations with any violent crimes. If we got the idea that stop and search was only legitimate in very violent locations, shouldn't be used elsewhere, that would be a way of promoting a dialogue that could bring people together about police policies, including the police themselves, where the police not patrolling hotspots remains one of the biggest areas for targeting micro areas and explaining to the public why police are not seen on most beats, but that they're in the few beats that are most in need and based on good testing, as Anthony Braga and his colleagues have consistently uh, demonstrated for 20 years. And with public seeing 3D maps, I think we have a great possibility for the public to understand why you don't patrol everywhere equally, either in Tokyo or in Birmingham, UK, with the vast areas of these cities completely free of serious crime. Barrie, Ontario, population 153,000, showed uh, this map of crime um, uh, concentrations by using the Canadian crime severity scores. 
and they had a dialogue with the city council on the public record reported in the newspapers. Our teams are now deployed proactively uh, to areas that are considered high harm hotspots. We are targeting high harm locations, testing evidence-based crime reduction, and tracking the results. That's what's going on in public. So how do we test this as an experiment? Let me close by suggesting that any jurisdiction with 100 police stations, uh, and there's a number of them in the English-speaking world, they can tally detailed evidence and take a 12-month rolling average. Every month, they can produce an internal report and discuss it with all of the police working in the station. And you can take 100 baseline legitimacy surveys of the public. Then you can randomly assign 50 of those 100 stations to have a community meeting every month the day after the police discuss the statistics for the station commander to discuss it with members of the public and to explain or hear feedback on various policies that they're going to pursue in light of all of the evidence of the three T's. After a year, you repeat the surveys in a, all hundred of these police station areas and see whether police legitimacy was higher after that period than the, the, in, where the data were presented to the, the 50 stations every month compared to the 50 stations that didn't receive the data or a dialogue around the data. We can test this idea. We can get better at protecting the treasure of liberal democracy. We can make this a country that immigrants want to come to as Vollmer's parents did uh, from Germany after the revolution of 1848, a country that officers Jason Rivera and Wilbert Mora uh, parents wanted to come to uh, because liberal democracy is what they wanted and Vollmer's parents would be very proud to know that his son has protected liberal democracy, not only by being a great police leader, but by founding the American Society of Criminology in that living room uh, that you see pictured below in 1941. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to take some questions and very glad, again, that you're all here with me. Thank you, Professor Sherman, uh, for that thought-provoking lecture. Uh, again, many of you asked if this was going to be available on uh, uh, video. Yeah, the answer is yes. And also, uh, we will be sending the lecture itself uh, in published form from CPP to all of the registrants here today. Uh, Professor Sherman, we have a number of questions for you, uh, and I hope we can get through many of them uh, in the next uh, few minutes, uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, let me jump right in to some of these uh, really, really difficult and good questions. Um, someone asked, uh, part of the three T's require changes to police organization and to accountability infrastructure. And this question was posed about what leads police agencies uh, to have hesitancy about introducing more transparent procedures, increasing accountability, or limiting officer discretion. Well, as a great management theorist once put it, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And the culture of secrecy that surrounds government in this mother of all democracies, as it likes to style itself, where I'm a dual citizen, uh, culture of secrecy is endemic uh, in the idea that um, with the democracy potentially causing trouble, we, we know the right thing to do and we don't want interference from the outside. And we certainly don't want pressure groups coming in and um, demanding things. But ironically, the pressure groups very often don't care about the data. And you might find that the police would be relieved from pressure groups if they could be more transparent about the data and look at studies like the one we just published showing that domestic violence advocates showing up in court are actually causing or potentially causing um, more harm uh, than good to the victims who they're supporting with well-intentioned efforts. But the preliminary evidence, um, which is not random assignment, uh, but it, it leaves cause for concern. And to have the police be able to discuss that sort of thing in public, in open meetings, is, is important, although we have to accept the modern culture of screaming, of bullying, of shouting, leaves nobody really with a great appetite for public meetings. And, and yet, maybe Zoom conferences are the way around it. The police and crime commissioners have hundreds of people coming to their, their meetings now on Zoom when they used to have 30 or 40 people in a church basement. 
And in my experience, people tend to behave better on Zoom <laughs> than in church basements. So we can just uh, see how it goes if we give it a try. Thank you. Uh, another question was raised that um, it might be the case that if police do things just right, people might not be sure that they've done anything at all. They might not see that, right? So when the seemingly inevitably bad thing happens or goes viral, it's easy for people to criticize the status quo as not effective enough or to justify the bad thing that just happened. How do agencies and researchers better communicate with the public about what that sweet spot is and how to assess whether they're working on it or not? It's a very interesting challenge to uh, promote the achievement of making something not happen. Um, and uh, that is, is not um, uh, commonly done, but in public health, uh, people keep pointing to historical victories like the conquest of smallpox declared extinct in 1978, um, the recent success with the COVID vaccines. I, I think there's lots of stories that can be told uh, at the moment in evidence-based policing about innovative policing driving down violent crime. So I think you've got to lead with your strength. You've got to brag. You've got to make uh, the poster child look uh, quite appealing that this has been a triumph of not just uh, brawn in policing, but brains and using better methods, um, which makes me think that, you know, part of the culture war that's going on is about education. And so there's resistance within policing to using methods that require more education, statistics and so forth. And, and that's something we have to confront. But one way to do it is to, is to hire police officers and then help them get educated, which is the policy in the moment in Britain with all constables getting a degree education even though many of them are opposed to it. And there's still certainly the older officers who don't have degrees uh, create the culture of opposition to having an educated police force. But I, I think as time goes by, we're moving more into digital skills that require a level of understanding that's equivalent to university educations and which might help everybody to become comfortable with um, uh, imaginative use of data for diagnostics and for suggesting ideas for how to get around things, including uh, these ideas about using video policing rather than sending police cars who get there four hours later rather than having a, a, a two minute transfer from the call taker to a police officer responding by video interaction. Thank you very much, Larry, for that response. Um, you've got a couple questions here about over policing and one attendee was interested in your knowledge about legislative developments made either in the US or the UK to make police officers more accountable for their wrongdoing in their everyday activities. Do we know much about those developments and whether or not they can be effective? Well, I think the situation is very different in the US where police unions have far more power than they do in the UK. And the powers in the US to uh, protect um, uh, the data that would be involved, certainly in predicting police misconduct. Uh, th they're much greater and much more complex um, than, than in the UK. On the other hand, in the UK, what we're seeing is the parliament trying to give police powers that they don't want to give them more clout in terms of what to do with people in demonstrations if, for example, they can move themselves to the highway. And the more powers that the police get uh, along these lines, the more implicit duty they have to enforce the laws in ways that really offend large parts of the public. COVID, I think, has been a disaster for police legitimacy because there's so much intrusion into every everyday life. People sitting on a park bench at a time when you're only allowed outdoors to exercise. Obviously, you're not exercising. Here's a a 90-pound fine because you're sitting down rather than jogging or running around, uh, walking on the beach uh, alone. Here's, here's your COVID violation ticket. It just doesn't make sense. And um, I think the police, as a profession, like doctors and teachers, need to push back more against government, putting them into a position that's guaranteed to erode their legitimacy in, in ways that, sure, people are mad at politicians, uh, but they're also mad at the police because they are carrying out the will of a liberal democracy. Staying on the same uh, kind of uh, comparative 
theme. Uh, one participant noted that the standards in the US seem lower than in the European Convention for the Prevention of Torture and Inhumane Treatment and Punishment. What are your thoughts on some of the comparative aspects of just right policing in, in reality? Well, I think you have um, this idea of proportionality in um, English common law that goes right back to 1361 and somehow got lost traveling across the Atlantic Ocean because common law was actually used in most US states. Half of them at the time of Tennessee v. Garner were still incorporating common law from the 18th century. But what the British uh, doctrine of uh, not enforcing the law unless two conditions are met, one is that there is evidence that the law has been violated. But the second is that it's in the public interest to actually enforce the law. And that's where you have massive use of discretion not to arrest people uh, who are trying to throw a statue in the harbor. And a major argument between uh, a leading uh, uh, cabinet mem member and uh, the, the chief constable whose men uh, and women made the decision not to try to stop the crowd from taking the statue down, thereby probably avoiding a lot of violence. On the continent with the Napoleonic tradition, that doctrine doesn't exist. And I actually think that policing in the UK is certainly much lighter touch. It's the UK that doesn't have guns. France, Germany, um, Austria, all of these Napoleonic countries, they have guns, they have codes, the codes are very detailed, and the police have an absolute obligation to enforce the law whenever the evidence is against it. And I don't think people like their police nearly as much on the continent as they do in the, in the UK, where police get lots of criticism, but they're um, widely supported and, and have higher support levels than, than in the US. Larry, one of the attendees asked if you were aware of research in on the three T's or kind of similar ideas of the three T's in probation or community supervision. What are your thoughts on, on kind of transference between police and, and probation and community corrections? Oh, look, I think the generality of the three T's goes way beyond the criminal justice system, but it certainly fits into probation and the rank ordering of the uh, probation population from high risk of high harm to low risk of high harm, uh, which we've just done with some data from probation in the UK in which they identified 5% of the high risk people and our algorithms, which they weren't using, we identified 40%. And, and so we increased the accuracy eightfold if we use advanced statistical techniques rather than the traditional subjective, here I read the file, I read the interviews with the family, and, and this is what the school teachers had to say when he was 12 years old. I mean, that's the basis on which the psychiatrists in Britain let repeat murders out. We've had one guy kill three wives because on two occasions the psychiatrist said he won't do it again. But the, I guarantee you they didn't use big data uh, to make uh, predictions with false positive errors and, and uh, false negative errors taken into account. I think not only can probation do that, but so can prisons in, in terms of uh, using prison management uh, with different models of risk levels in, in a wing where it's still a lot of people getting killed in prisons. It's, it's a major murder uh, management issue. Um, and in a way, uh, Bill Clinton uh, started it in presidential campaigning when he said, Every Democratic president uh, as candidate uh, for the last 100 years has gone to Nebraska to try to get the electoral votes. Not once has Nebraska given electoral votes to a Democrat. I'm not going to Nebraska. That's targeting. That's saving your resources for where they can do more good. Thank you, Larry, for that. Um, two of the attendees kind of asked a, a question about how do we implement, how do we institutionalize some of these ideas into practice? One asked about, you know, that researchers seem to be advanced on the data analytics and doing the research, but it hasn't quite gotten um, into or accepted by many police agencies. And another attendee also asked about academy curriculum. What could be taught in academy curriculum that might help? Uh, any thoughts on institutionalization within everyday? Absol absolutely. The American Society for Evidence-Based Policing, led by Renee Mitchell, who's uh, another graduate of the Cambridge uh, program and met many police leaders from Britain here. She has been uh, a prime example of pracademics, people who have been police practitioners who do research, who get other pracademics together and they talk about research. 
And I think they're the vanguard. They're the people who, like the medical practitioners 100 years ago, who had a scientific education, which would have been 1% of all of the doctors who were out there as you know, sawbones, literally having learned it by an apprenticeship with somebody who didn't know what they were doing either. Uh, so there's a hundred year example of transforming a craft into a science-based profession where now the doctors are almost complaining there's too much science and they're asking for computerized programs like Watson to give them a good diagnosis and a good uh, prognosis of what medicine or surgery should, should be used. We can do all of that as we develop in policing through, I think, social networks. Building social networks of supporters uh, has been uh, very successful in the UK. And uh, I'm increasingly going to various police agencies to talk about uh, the government's initiative to do more hotspots policing. And they say, yeah, we took one of your courses at Cambridge. And it's not just the Cambridge thing. It's the fact that people who have studied evidence-based policing at University College London or London School of Economics, and the, the whole idea of using facts in policing, the development of police analysts, uh, this is supporting the uh, practitioners who might not have studied the analysis, but they might appreciate the use of it. And as long as you have senior leaders like Alex Murray, commander of New Scotland Yard, promoting the idea you can do better policing, you can win, you can pre prevent serious crime. Um, and now we have a police minister saying it in Kit Malthouse. Uh, that helps under our political structure, which is far more centralized with 43 police forces for 60 million people in the UK than in the US. But I think the biggest hope in the US is the big cities and to have more people in the big cities um, study uh, with uh, whatever programs are available to help them understand uh, what you can do with evidence and how you can change policing operationally to be more successful. But I, I go back to the culture eating strategy for breakfast. You can have all the strategy you want, but the first strategic question is how do you change the culture? And that's where education, I think, has to be the foundation. And I think Volmer would agree with you on that. Uh, let, me just say, let me just say that, um, Larry, there have been so many wonderful questions and I'm sorry we can't get through them all. Uh, and I thank all of you for them. Uh, they're very thoughtful and, and interesting. And I'm, again, apologize we can't get to them. But let me uh, end our Volmer address today by thanking you, Larry, for joining us today and providing us with always, as, as always, uh, very interesting ideas to contemplate and to try to institutionalize and think about as we go through our research or our practice. We really appreciate you. We thank you. We um, congratulate you on your Volmer Award. And uh, again, everyone, we will be following up with um, some information for you about this lecture. But we thank all of you for participating today. Thank you very much.